Living in New York City is expensive and sometimes it can be challenging to afford even the basic necessities such as clothing and furniture. Did you know that you may be eligible for funding to help offset the cost of certain items for your loved one with an intellectual or developmental disability? The Family Reimbursement Program at ADAPT Community Network is here to help. Give us a call today at 1-877-827-2666 to see if you qualify. Hello and welcome to ADAPT Community Network's 2021 Virtual Family Connect Summit. We are so pleased that you could join us. This is Session H, Transition to Adulthood and OPWDD Funded Services, What You Need to Know. And our session will begin shortly following this brief introduction. My name is Tracy Bakar, and I am the Vice President of Family Support Services here at ADAPT Community Network. ADAPT is a nonprofit provider of an array of services for children, teens, and adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities who live across the five boroughs of New York City. To learn more about our range of services, please call Project Connect, our information and referral line at 877-827-2666. This session will include a review of many OPWDD services available to individuals with IDD, both prior to and after graduation from school with an emphasis on different day habilitation and employment service options. The presenters will cover the steps necessary in establishing eligibility for OPWDD services and how to find the most appropriate services and support to meet each individual's needs and wants. Our presenters are Karen Liebman and Kelly Spina. Ms. Liebman has been with ADAPT Community Network for 21 years. As coordinator of operations, she oversees the Adult Day Services Admissions Unit. Ms. Liebman has a master's degree in disability studies and is also an adjunct lecturer at CUNY School of Professional Studies. Ms. Spina is a licensed master social worker. She has been in the field of social services and developmental disabilities for over 10 years. In her current role as Senior Coordinator of Operations, she oversees the Day Habilitation Division for ADAPT Community Network. After the session, we encourage you to submit your questions by emailing them to projectconnect at adaptcommunitynetwork.org. We hope you enjoy the session. Hello, welcome to the session on transition to adulthood. My name is Karen Liebman and I'm a coordinator of operations at ADAPT Community Network. I also oversee day program admissions. Hello, my name is Kelly Spina. I'm the Senior Coordinator of Operations for Adult Day Habilitation Division. So today's session will cover eligibility for OPWDD services, and then we'll take a look at two of the most common services for adults, day habilitation and supported employment. We hope you find the session useful. So first, I'm going to give you a brief overview of OPWDD and the eligibility process. OPWDD stands for the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, and it's the state agency responsible for coordinating DD services. Um, a full overview would take much more time than we have, but I will take you through the main steps in the eligibility process and um, hopefully explain some of the terminology as well. These are the three main pieces to getting services and supports for someone. You must obtain initial eligibility, you must go through the front door, and you must get care coordination. I want to point out that you don't necessarily need to go through the steps in any particular order. The system does have some flexibility built into it so that you can start at different points and still end up in the same place. But ultimately, you do need to complete all of the steps. So you've most likely heard that you have to go through the front door to get services, and this is true. And what exactly is the front door? Um, it's really the entry point to getting started with OPWDD. Once you make initial contact with the front door, you'll be asked to complete what they call an information session. You can register online for this, uh, or you can call to schedule it. Right now, the sessions are all being presented virtually. And the session will give you information on the types of supports and services that are available to your family member 
and we'll go over how the front door process and the eligibility process works. Once you've completed the information session, a front door facilitator will reach out to you for um, what's called the phone interview. This is to complete what's called the DDP2 or the Developmental Disability Profile. The interviewer will ask you questions about the person's ability and needs, and that will result in an overall score. Now, this score helps determine the level of support that your family member needs, and it will help guide your front door facilitator in recommending services for your family member. OK, so who um, exactly is eligible for OPWDD services? Well, you must have a diagnosis of a developmental disability. Uh, this may include intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, autism, epilepsy, neurological impairments, and a few others. You must have been diagnosed before the age of 22. The disability must be permanent and cause a substantial handicap, meaning it's difficult to live everyday life independently. So the person has to have one of those aforementioned diagnoses and need supports on an ongoing basis. In order to prove that you are eligible or that your family member is eligible, you need to submit certain documents to OPWDD. Um, there is a transmittal form, um, kind of like a cover sheet with information. And along with that, you have to submit a psychological evaluation, a psychosocial evaluation, and a medical or you know an annual physical. Um, if you've already contacted the front door, someone there will help you through this process. The same thing with a CCO. If you've already contacted a care coordination organization, they can help guide you through the eligibility process. Um, there is specific criteria on what documents you have to send and what they should look like. Um, we don't have time to go into that here. If you're interested, you can look on the OPWDD website, which really gives a, a thorough explanation of everything that you have to submit. But again, um, at the point where you're submitting these documents, you will have someone to guide you through the process and make sure that you're getting the correct documents in order. So the final piece um, is selecting a care coordination organization. And um, there are a few choices, several choices in our region. Um, you have the choice to pick one. You can look on their website and you know kind of make a decision. If you're not happy at any time, you can change that to another CCO. Um, you're able to contact one of these CCOs directly to get started with the whole process, or if you've contacted the front door first, the front door facilitator will tell you about your options and will connect you with one of them. Um, once you're enrolled with the CCO, um, you'll be assigned a care manager, and that care manager will work with you to develop the person's life plan. A life plan is an individualized service plan that's kind of like the roadmap to identifying the person's goals and dreams and how to get there. Now, you might have heard the term waiver services, and I want to explain what those are. Um, these are services outside of the traditional Medicaid services that medical services, I'm sorry, that Medicaid pays for. Um, so home and community based waiver services programs, services, and supports that are funded by Medicaid. And the waiver waives certain Medicaid rules so that states can use Medicaid long-term long care dollars to support people in the community. There is a separate enrollment piece for the waiver that your front door facilitator and your care manager will guide you through. And these are some of the most common home and community-based waiver supports and services. Once you're officially, once your family member is officially enrolled in the waiver, um, you can apply for these services through an agency of your choice. Now, I want to briefly mention Medicaid because you do have to have Medicaid to receive most OPD, OPWDD services, including all home and community-based waiver services and care coordination. We're not going to get into how to apply for Medicaid in this presentation, but there is a separate session on benefits and, and entitlements um, in this Family Connect Summit that I highly encourage you to attend. You've jumped through all the hoops. Your family has Medicaid, your family member has Medicaid. 
you have gotten OPWDD eligibility, you've gone through the front door, you've chosen a CCO, and you've been assigned a care manager. Now what? Now you need to figure out which services will best assist your family member in attaining their personal goals, and you need to figure out where to get them, which agencies. So I'm going to give you a few suggestions um, today. The first suggestion is to start early so that you have time to explore options and that you're not scrambling at the last minute. OPWDD liaisons do work with the schools to plan for the transition to adult services, and it starts um, around age 14 or age 15, but we encourage you to start the eligibility process much sooner. Um, so the process can be lengthy, as I'm sure you've realized, but also there are many, many services and supports uh, that younger children and teens and families can benefit from. So start early. The second recommendation is to do lots of research. Go to resource fairs, attend um, presentations like this one, look at the websites of different agencies, call to ask questions, visit programs, talk to other parents, go on the OPWDD website and look around, reach out to your uh, family member school transition coordinator even before they reach out to you. You can reach out to the parent coordinator or the teacher. If you have a care manager already, if your family member has been getting services, start talking to them early about transition options. Don't wait till the last minute. They may not think to bring it up. Do everything you can think of to make sure you know what options are out there so that the services you and your family members select and the agencies that are providing them are the best ones to support them in living the kind of life that they want. I hope I've given you a clear but brief overview of the OPWDD eligibility process. We will provide contact information for the front door and other resources and also ourselves at the end of the presentation. But now we're going to shift into talking about two common HCBS waiver services for young adults, dehabilitation and supported employment. So we'll give a brief overview of what they are and also what they look like at ADAPT Community Network. As I mentioned earlier in the introduction, I oversee admissions for DAYHEP programs at ADAPT Community Network. And at this agency, we take a very person-centered and collaborative approach to the process. So the, uh, the person and his or her family or advocate, the care manager, the day program staff, and the admissions unit all work together to go through the referral process and to determine which program is the best environment in which the person can thrive and grow. So this is our admissions process um, at the agency. Uh, first, we, the care manager will submit a referral form with some supporting documentation so we can learn a little bit about the person and um, what they're looking for. Once the referral packet is complete, we'll send it to one of our programs or one or more of our programs, um, depending on which ones the person's interested in and which ones we think must, might be most appropriate. The program staff will reach out to you to schedule a tour. Right now we're doing tours in person or virtually, depending on your comfort level. And then once the team has kind of decided which program might be the best fit for the person, a screening meeting or an intake meeting will be scheduled so that um, you can learn more about the program and the program staff can learn more about your family member and what they're looking for and make sure that it really is going to be a good fit for the person. Um, once it is decided that the person is going to enroll there, um, that team, um, the admissions unit, the family, the care manager, and the program staff all work together to complete the enrollment process. So that piece can be a little bit lengthy. There are you know, a few steps you have to go through. Some approvals are needed by OPWDD. The program needs to make sure that they have everything that they need to keep your family members safe once they start attending. And But we all work together to make sure that that process goes as smoothly as, pro as possible. And then before the person starts, a pre-planning meeting is scheduled 
with your family member, with you, with the care manager, and with the day program staff to welcome the person, welcome you to the program and to the agency, to give you any last minute information, to an answer any last minute questions, and then agree on a start date. That process can feel a bit lengthy and time consuming, but as I said earlier, we want to ensure that each and every individual finds the most appropriate program to support them in developing their interests and reaching their personal goals. So now I'm going to hand it over to Kelly Spina, who's going to tell you about our wonderful day programs at ADAPT Community Network and what they have to offer. Day habilitation is typically for adults over the age of 21, and it's a service that takes place outside of your home, usually at something we call a certified site, meaning more of a location, like a building. Um, we even have services that actually begin and end in the community as well. Day habilitation assists people to acquire, retain, and also improve things like their self-help, socialization, their adaptive skills, and they include things like, how are they communicating? How are they traveling? How strong do they feel in those areas? And even things that pertain to adult education. These activities and environments are designed to foster more independence for the person, more access to the community and in community inclusion, relationship building, self-advocacy, um, knowing your rights and informed choice are all themes that are part of a day habilitation. And additionally, people accessing Dayhab will often contribute to their communities through volunteer work and may even be working towards employment. So when we say day habilitation site base, we mean a physical location, although that physical location might have a lot of um, activities and integration with the community through partnerships that we have or um, places that we have relationships with. The without walls is another modality, meaning that that person's entire day predominantly would take place in the community, um, doing activities that they prefer through partnerships, relationships that we have, and things that are just accessible to the community in general, like libraries and parks and museums. So Adopt Community Network has a slew of different programs throughout New York City. We have campuses in almost every borough with um, different locations in the Bronx, a couple of them in Manhattan. We have a few sites in Brooklyn and then one site in Staten Island at Port Richmond Avenue. So in 2017, we published our first course catalog which was something we were really excited to do that featured activities in all of our locations through New York City. They were predominantly community-based activities, including things like overnight trips and really niche opportunities for people that had very specific interests. So we've had opportunities for people to go snorkeling, to go uh, flying a plane, to be able to jet ski and surf and this was really great because it allowed people that were similarly interested to do those activities that they enjoyed, regardless of where they were enrolled at the time. And a lot has changed, um, predominantly due to the pandemic, but also in our desire to stay current and fresh. We've transitioned all of that onto our digital TV guide that we call Trumba. Trumba is something we are super proud of and excited about. It is a digital guide that has programming all day long that people that are enrolled in our day have can join. In a typical day, you might find somewhere of upwards of almost 30 shows that people are able to join with really niche interests like theater, coding, fitness, advocacy, cooking, environmentalism. It's just really been a wonderful opportunity for people to dive into the things that they enjoy without it having geography affect who is in that class or how they're able to get access to that. And what we love is that people can really pick on their own and add it to their calendar so they're in charge of creating their own schedules. And there's a lot of autonomy behind that. So this has definitely made Dayhab better. Not only are the classes tailored by staff and people that 
work with people with intellectual disabilities and understand um, their abilities and strengths. But now what we're finding more is that the staff are actually supporting our um, people to create their own classes. They want to have classes that they're running with things that they're interested in. And we love that it's helped people align more with their life plans and their goals and has actually created a pretty large global reach, which we're really excited about especially as other people put their services and things online, like different international organizations, international museums, and things like that, our uh, cohort is able to really access that, which has been exciting. Staying connected. So you can see on the upper right-hand side of the corner, this young lady had started her own group where folks can come and just express themselves openly, honestly, and candidly. And that group actually gets a, a large um, a large audience. Uh, we also had a group that was uh, able to meet with um, Eric Adams, and this was really prior to his mayoral run. So it was exciting to speak to this person about advocacy and policy. And we have a lot of people that are really interested in that area that wanted to ask questions and know what opportunities you know await them and and what kind of policies they might be able to change as it relates to their interests. And the last flyer you can see is for an international play festival. This is what we mean by the whole globe kind of jumping on the digital bandwagon. It's been nice to have opportunities to things outside of just the New York City area and really pushing the boundaries of what we expose our people supported to. So this is a video where a person was actually able to meet the head coach of the Toronto Raptors and receive a happy birthday from him. Um, apologies because this video won't be able to play, but it's a really great opportunity to see how unique the experiences we bring to people's plates and how much we really just want to make people's dreams come true. So all of this has actually led to an expansion of understanding how technology works day to day understanding that in order to get to my favorite show, I log in to a phone, to a tablet, to a computer. Um, I have to unmute myself if I'd like to be heard. I have to raise my hand and use a mouse to toggle and click. And I think that at the same time, a lot of this digital etiquette, we were all learning ourselves, right? You know, to have a clear background, to make sure we can be seen straightforward on camera, um, these were all skills that we found the people that we were working with begin to develop. And that really led us to feel that it was important to invest in technology. We wanted everyone to have access to these classes. We wanted everyone to have access to the skills of learning how to use these devices that are truly becoming more integrated in all of our lives. Um, in the beginning, we had modeled our platform to really be almost like a radio show where regardless of a visual, you could still listen in and enjoy, follow along and understand what was going on. But since disseminating hundreds of iPads and Chromebooks, what we have found is that the video usage has skyrocketed. Everyone wants to have their camera on. Everyone wants to see each other. And that's really been exciting for us to see that this is working and that people are actually um, adapting not only to the change, but using the technology that they've been provided. And this has created something that we have called portable literacy. It's led to a lot of changes in the person's life outside of day half, because now after hours and on weekends, on days that they're not there, their technology still works and they're still able to zoom in with family members, relatives. They've learned that they can join their favorite exercise group or their synagogue or church classes online. They're able to reach their friends and family at a push of a button. And that's been super life-changing for people. It's also allowed us to put, push the boundaries of tying in together adaptive technology um, to improve their quality of life on their iPads and their Chromebooks like having lights that switch on and off or using other um, adaptive devices like plugs that are now you're able to use through the iPad. And so what we found is that it's really something that's going to be part of their life that they're able to use. 
And especially as it relates to employability and even volunteering, more people are working from home these days, you know, and for those that would have never really been able to manage in a traditional job setting because of social phobias, because of issues with barriers or transportation or um, sensory issues, all of what we've been using in Zahab now has this translatability to be able to really support someone that might want um, a different opportunity or to be employed. At ADAPT, we have something called SEMP, which is our Supported Employment Division. Um, it assists people to obtain and maintain a paid competitive job in the community. We have intensive SEMP, which includes intensive job development and coaching. Um, an individual is eligible if they have not been employed or if they were employed less than 365 days. We then have something called extensive SEMP, which includes an ongoing job coaching and career development services. So if a person is eligible, um, they um, if, uh, if they've been working in a an, an work environment and earning at least minimum wage. So who is eligible? Something called Access VR is first necessary, and Access VR stands for Adult Career and Continuing Education Services Vocational Rehabilitation. So a person with a disability that impacts your ability to get, keep, or advance in a job is eligible. You must currently reside in New York State and be available to participate in the vocational rehabilitation process that they have outlined. You must be at least 14 years of age and be legally able to work in the United States. So in order to be enrolled in most supportive employment programs, you must have access VR and OPWDD eligibility. ADAPT's SEMP program has something called a pre-employment and supportive employment option. The pre-employment is where you learn about the world of work and what it's like and what the expectations are. Um, we expose individuals through different volunteering and internship partnerships that ADAPT has with different institutions and organizations. We do a person-centered assessment of that person's skills. What are their interests? What are their support needs? What are their abilities? Because we're really invested in that person being successful. Um, the supported employment is actually more aimed at matching job seekers with the right job based on what their strengths and interests are. They receive an individualized job coach, which helps them to become successful and is invested in their success. They work on not only ongoing support, but professional development and ongoing professional development. These resources are, um, these resources are able to help you with some of the information that we've discussed today in these PowerPoints. I always encourage people to take a quick photo because you never know um, when you might just need to connect to Project Connect, which is ADAPT's in-house. Um, we like to call it our switchboard where people are able to just learn and get connected to the right services for them. On the left hand side, you're also going to see information that pertains to the front door where people can get information about eligibility, OPWDD eligibility specifically. You have um, the emails for our day habilitation admissions person who is Karen Liebman, and you also have information for our supported employment division director who is Horatio Woods. And then on the bottom left hand side, there's information about the DD councils in your borough. Um, we want to thank you for joining today. We hope you find today's information valuable and please feel free to connect with us if you have any follow up questions.